In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. These girls are so busy down here, I'm going to interrupt their fun. <laughs> How are you? See, they, they're shy. They're shy. Well, where do you live? Can you tell me where you live? No, not Canada. Live in Raleigh? Yeah. You live in a house? Do you live in a house? Yeah. Yeah. In Raleigh. In North Carolina? You live in North Carolina? No, you don't live in North Carolina. You do. You live in North Carolina, in the United States, on the North American continent. But yeah, what place? <laughs> it's earth. Sometimes my wife thinks I live on Mars. But that's another story. Y'all need to worry about that. Yeah, we live on the earth. And we, we live, we go from our house to our city, maybe our neighborhood first, our city, our state, our country, our continent, the whole world. Well, who made that whole world? Do you know? Did God make that world? God made that whole world. They're, they're just intent on their coloring. and God made the whole world. God made everything that we have. Everything we enjoy, even some things we might not enjoy. God made it all. And you know what? God gave it to us. God gave it to us. Aren't you, don't you like when you get a gift? Yeah, getting a gift is exciting. She's so... She's being shy. She's not this shy. You're, I know you better. You are excited when you get a gift. And I want us to be excited because we need to recognize that God gave us our home, the earth. And the air we breathe, and the water we drink, or swim in, the mountains we enjoy climbing, everything we see comes from God. And so I want us to be grateful to God. And that's what we're going to talk about in the sermon today about being grateful to a good God, okay? So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for creating our homes, which, are the, which is the earth. We thank you for creating everything that we have. We love you, God, and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, now you can go back to the important stuff. We heard the good news of the gospel in our first reading and Christ's command for us to go and make disciples. And we continue to hear the good news contained in Scripture, turning to Genesis, chapter 1, 
verse 1. And so I invite you to hear this living word from a living God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants, yielding every good seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seeds of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals, of the earth of every kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant, yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, 
And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, making on it, and because of it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of heavens and the earth when they were created. And this is the word of God given to us, the people of God. invite you to pray with me. Holy Lord, as your word here is proclaimed, descend your spirit into this space. Walk among us. Let us ponder the holy mysteries you place before us. Let us find trust in your love. Let us provide, let us find hope in what you give. Lord, walk among us. We are ready to listen. Be glorified in this moment. Be glorified, Lord, in everything that is said and in all that is done. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today's text begins with a phrase that it makes sense to use when beginning a story. In the beginning. Of course, we know that this beginning spoken of in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is not really the beginning of all things. We pick up God's story at the point when God created the heavens and the earth, or when God began creating, as some Bible translations render this verse. But as we come to this text, we ought to realize that there was something before we reach Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. God is the creator of all things, but God is not created. Many people find God in nature, and it is true that God's presence can be powerfully and profoundly found in the natural order around us, but God exists outside of that order. God is the creator again not one of the created. John begins his gospel, as you probably will recall, telling us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. In other words, God has no beginning or end. No starting date, no expiration date. The biological clocks that track the length of our lives, they simply do not tick for God. The eternal existence of God, this Trinitarian relationship of Father and Son and Holy Spirit, always has been, forever will be, and it stretches the mind beyond any of our abilities to fully comprehend exactly who God is. A pastor friend of mine once asked, was once asked by a child before church one Sunday, who are God's parents? Well, my friend, I will say, uh, he surrendered to the mystery, and he punted his answer, telling the child that that was an excellent question, and she ought to go ask her own parents. I'm sure those parents were so pleased with their pastor that Sunday morning. But of course, we know God has no parents. God didn't come into being from anywhere or by anyone, but comprehending such a truth is a real struggle. We know, however, God's truth often does not make sense to us logically. But it does make holy sense. God knows that even if we do not, even if we cannot comprehend such a wonderful mystery. On this Trinity Sunday, the best we might do is simply celebrate the truth about God that Reverend Carolyn Lewis writes when she says the Trinity asserts God with us. The Trinity affirms God's presence. The Trinity avows that no matter what 
and in whatever circumstance, God will be there. God will be there. The assurance of God's eternal being and endless presence is a fine place, I think, to begin our summer uh, sermon series about who are we, asking the question, who are we? June through August, I will be preaching through the book of Genesis and hoping that these precious texts will provide wonderful insight into who we are. But perhaps more importantly, we will gain insight into who God is and who God made each one of us to be. Judy Fentress Williams writes in her, holy, her book, Holy Imagination, that Genesis is an origin story where God plays a dominant role as the creator, and humans, the creation, us, play a significant role. Told and retold, these origin stories speak of how things began and how these events inform our identity, both secret and known. I pray this summer's sermonic journey will be a fruitful one for each and every one of us. Now, this creation story, along with the second account of creation that comes in Genesis chapter 2 that we won't have time to get to today, but there are two stories of the creation, and both tell us about who God is, who God made us to be. Certainly, we don't get any scientific answers here in Genesis. This text is not a biology book. It is not an earth science lesson. It has nothing to do with evolution or creationism as political stances. The text that starts with, in the beginning, is simply this. It is a love story. It is a love story. Telling of God's love and the object of God's love, God's creation. Creation was not a mandate placed upon God for, to fulfill. Creation was God's choice. It was God's choice. Look around and see the bounty of the earth and the beauty of the sky. Witness the glory of a sunrise or the calmness of the dusk. See the ferocity of the wind and the rain in a storm or the gentle breeze on a spring day. The majesty of wildlife, great and small, or the mysteries of the human body. And what you see is simply the overflow of God's love manifest in a creative impulse, bringing order from chaos, light from darkness, fullness from emptiness, life from death. Creation is God's gift. Its formation is beyond any human ability. Its generosity surpasses any human desire. Its beauty exceeds any human imagination. The psalmist offers that God alone, God alone set the foundations for the earth so that it shall never be shaken and make springs gush forth in the valleys, giving refreshment to every living thing providing all the things needed, even a refuge in the mountains and protection in the night. With the touch of God's hands, the very mountains smoke. And because of this great gift, we, God's creatures, the ones that God made just a little lower than the angels, we can sing with praise to God for our being, for our lives, for everything we had, for everything we have and for everything we will have. Yes, today is a day when we can praise, we can worship with great joy God Almighty, our Creator. Now creation, this is a mysterious gift given by an awesome God. God gives us a reason to be thankful. God gives us a reason to worship. And God does it with just three simple words. It was good. It was good. God declares what has been created is good. God brings light from darkness, creates night and day, separated the waters from the waters, 
brought forth land and sky, filled the land with all sorts of vegetation, and saw it was good. God then filled the star, the sky with stars, named a great light sun and a lesser light moon, and again saw that what had been made was good. God created all sorts of swarming life. Just look around. It's coming, coming into being. It's coming into, coming into life. You see things now, bugs and everything else crawling along the ground. Creatures that fill the air and sea monsters too. He had saw that did that and said it was good. And then came life on the land, wild animals and cattle and creeping things. And here too, God said, God saw it was good. See, God's love is on powerful display in this story of creation. But His love was not yet finished. Although the earth and the sky had been generously filled by God's hand, God's love overflowed yet again. God's love was not exhausted. Just when you think God is done giving, God always gives more. And humankind, humankind was created in God's own image. And humankind was given dominion, radah, given control, reign over it all. And when God saw everything that God had made, God said yet again, not only it was good, it was very good. It was exceedingly good. Creation was now complete. God's love poured forth in purpose. Every created thing glorified God, advanced God's intentions, fulfilled God's holy plan. All things were made to work together for good. It was indeed very good. And then God rested. These instances of God declaring the goodness of creation, these are not incidental or accidental parts of the story. These are instead the centerpieces of the creation narrative. And in them we see a God who truly is, who God is made us to be, we can find in these centerpieces. The Hebrew, from which the word good is translated, has two meanings that may help us unpack what is being communicated here. First of all, good means pleasant and right and having value. Simply put, God's will is perfect. And so anything that comes from the exercise of that will is also perfect. That means creation is perfect. God had good reason to declare it good. We sometimes, I will admit it, forget it. I forget it sometimes. Because after all, we view creation from this side of the fall. We see the world through the lens of sin. We see creation as but a shadow of what it truly was made to be. And when we look at the world only through the lens of sin, only after the corruption brought about because of the fall, the verdict that creation was first good becomes obscure. We often look at creation and evaluate it based on what we do with it or what we have done. It's shaped by our disobedience, our rebellion, our destructive desires, our insatiable appetite. And we believe that those are the things that define creation. Christians for centuries have celebrated the spiritual as pure and the temporal as contaminated. And this has shaped our view of faith over the years and the work of the church. It's made us passive and cautious. So many simply wait for the earth to pass away so that we can all go to heaven. Why we are so focused on the question, if I die tonight, will I get to heaven? We're so focused on that that we forget to ask, if I live through this night, what difference will it make to God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven? Yet God looked upon creation and called it good, very good. 
God wants creation to thrive. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven and God's home is among the mortals. Creation matters. It has purpose. It has a place. It is the location where God's kingdom grows. And yes, it is good. It is is very good. But God cares about what has been created, and we should care about it too. Remember, I said this word good has two different meanings. Well, good in the second sense means welfare, flourishing, benefit. In other words, God did not make our world for us one day to escape it, but God created for us a home in which we are stewards of it so that we might experience God's generosity and goodness among creation. God is sovereign. That means God is in control. God doesn't doesn't need us to look out for creation. It's not dependent upon us or anything like that. But instead, giving us stewardship over creation is another one of God's gifts. God's love again blooms in God's choice to make us co-creators. This decision is a gift within the larger gift of creation. We are called to be fruitful and to multiply, but don't confine that just to mean having children. We are to be fruitful and to multiply in love and peace and compassion and justice. That's why we were made in God's image, not to physically look like God, but to act with the ethics and the morality and the holiness of God, to be able to respond to Christ's call. God brought forth order out of chaos in the act of creation. And mystic Howard Thurman teaches that wherever there is order, there is responsibility. Wherever there is order, There is responsibility. Yes, responsibility for creation, for God's gifts. That is a wonderful gift that God gives us. I was talking with someone not long ago when they asked me, well, why are you a United Methodist? What makes you so different than everyone else? Well, there's a lot of reasons I'm different, but my theology may not be it because I don't really think United Methodists are that far different. Every United Methodist belief, it fits squarely within Orthodox Christian teaching. But as my conversation pressed me on why I am a United Methodist, why I stay a United Methodist, my my, um, my mind turned to the goodness of God. United Methodism is distinctive because the starting point from where we first think about God. We're distinctive because where we start. And the starting point helps us understand who God is. It helps me know what God cares about. We begin, you see, with God's grace rather than our sin. We certainly take our sin seriously. We lament its effects. We mourn its wide reach. We try to avoid it the best that we can. But we also know that God's grace is stronger than our sin. The serpent thinks he will have a victory, but let me tell you, you know this, God is greater. God is greater. Our story begins with holy love, not with dreadful sin. Before Adam before Eve, before the tree of knowledge, before animals and fish and birds and the land and the sky, the night and the day, before anything, anything at all, there was God. There has always been God. and There will always be God. And God is good. God created and called creation good. And we are part of that good creation. We have been redeemed and restored by Christ. And God gave us the responsibility to do all the good we can. 
in all the means we can, in all the ways we can, in all the places we can, to all the people we can, as long as ever we can. Thank you, Mr. Wesley, for such a great quote. Yes, beloved, it was good. It was very good. Glory to God. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you're able and let us together affirm our faith. Using the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 of your hymnal. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. invite us to go to the Lord in prayer. Creator God, you called forth order from chaos, making day and night, earth and sea, and every creature conceive. Your generosity is seen in the foundations of the universe as our understanding of it all grows, and where understanding ends, you do not depart from us, but you continue to be God yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God without beginning or end, God eternally with us. For this faithful presence, for your enduring love, for your boundless grace shared with us in your Son, Christ Jesus, and in the Holy Spirit, whose power carries us through all the days of our lives, we give praise and thanks. Lord, as we hear this story of creation today, Inspire our hearts to co-create with you as stewards of your immense and plentiful gift. You give us the same creative impulse that first moved over the dark void and brought forth life. May our creativity add to the beauty of the world. May we use our intellect for constructive purposes that work within your creative intentions so that your will is done. Holy God, where we have been exploiters of creation rather than its protectors, when we have, been, we have given in to our ravenous appetites rather than to conserve your creation, forgive us and guide us toward actions that preserve rather than empty, protect rather than destroy, and act in accordance with your love rather than our human selfishness. God of fire and wind, as you sent the Holy Spirit upon the disciples at Pentecost. Do not let that wind be stilled or the flame grow cold in the days after Pentecost. May your holy presence grow stronger and stronger among us so that we eagerly follow Christ as he calls us. May we never be timid in our mission and ministry and always be about the work of sharing the good news so that those who have heard may hear yet again. And those who have not yet heard will hear about your gracious love. Let our witness glorify you and disrupt the ways of sin so that we bear the light of Christ into the world to heal what is broken, 
mend what is wounded, and bring a spirit of hope to all. Help us to live lives through which the light of Christ shines. And now, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for the lost, the searching, those who mourn, those who celebrate, those who are sick, those who are afraid, those who are alone, those who call out for help, and for those who suffer in silence. Lord, may your will be done. And God's church said amen. Friends, on this day, we come to this table. But we do not come under our own influence or our own, our own, under our own power. We come at the invitation of Jesus Christ. Jesus prepared this table. Jesus opens this table to everyone. The love of God is for us all. And we can experience that love and that grace here at this table. It is a joyous day. It is a joyous day. For all those who seek to live in peace with one another, all those who love God, all of those who are ready to repent of their sins, this is your place. You have heard Christ's invitation. And as we come to this table, as we prepare ourselves, we do confess our sins using the prayer that we, I hope on the wall. There we go. <laughs> Let us take time to go before Almighty God, cleansing our hearts with our own confession and trusting in Christ to give us grace. Holy God, maker of all things in heaven and on the earth, we humbly confess the unchecked appetites that threaten your creation and our home. We dominate rather than steward. We empty rather than fill. We are greedy when we ought to be generous. We are uncaring when we need to be watchful. Forgive us for our selfishness and ingratitude. Give us the mind of Christ and shape our hearts with love and grace. Hear us, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now I invite you to a few moments of silent prayer as you are able now to unburden your heart of whatever it is you need to lay before God this morning. Hear the good news, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now, as forgiven persons at work reconciling with one another, I invite you to stand as you're able and greet your neighbors to your left and your right with this sign, the peace of Christ. And for those online, we greet you in the name of Christ with his peace. You may be seated. In this season of Pentecost, after Pentecost, it is a season, as you will hear me say over and over again, about all of God's seasons, a season of generosity, a season of thankfulness, a season of gratitude. So let us show our thanks. Let us glorify God. Let us support the mission and ministry of this church with our tithes and our offerings. Whatever you give, however you give it, be blessed.
Father, we are so grateful for the ability to give that you give us as part of the gift of your wonderful creation. As we do give these gifts for your glory and for the service of the church, keep us humble. Help us to know that whatever we give, you give more. Whenever we're generous, you are far more generous. However we love, you love us more. We are grateful for all the gifts you bestow upon us. Give us the wisdom to use these wisely. In the name of Christ we pray. I'll invite you, as you are able, to continue standing for the great thanksgiving. You may follow along with congregational responses on page 15 of your hymnal. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. Oh, it is right, it is a good, it is a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Holy Lord. Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and the creator of earth, in the beginning your spirit moved over the face of the waters, and you formed us in your image, you breathed into us the very breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your Spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your holy word. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join together in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus the Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away from the temptations of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty all of those who had been oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you, you, Lord, would save your people. He healed the sick. Jesus fed the hungry. He ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, and his holy resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered each one of us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to always be with us, everywhere and at all times, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take it and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant. It is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance. On the day in which you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of this bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your holy church has continued in the breaking of bread and the sharing of cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we all offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim boldly the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all gathered here 
and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood and empowered by the gifts of the Spirit. By your Spirit, make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry for the whole world, showing forth the fruit of the Spirit until Christ shall come again in his final victory, and we will feast together at his heavenly and eternal banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And let us pray with confidence this prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Although we may be many, we are made one in the breaking of this bread. And this cup over which we give thanks, it is sure the assurance of salvation and our hope for the future. Friends, all is ready. The choir may come down and prepare to be served. As they do, I will mention that if you would prefer not to come forward and take in tension, uh, we have these pre-prepared cups that are available. An usher can provide them for you if you did not get them on the way in. If you need gluten-free bread, simply ask a server, and we have that available as well. All is ready, and all are invited to this holy meal. Let us give thanks. Would the servers come forward? Let us prepare. All is ready. Come forward as you are directed.
Has everyone been served? Anyone need to be served at their seat? We give thanks for this wonderful, holy mystery. And for those of you online, I want to say that even though the United Methodist Church does not practice any form of online communion, and we know that uh, you may feel somewhat of an exclusion from this service during the time of communion, please do not. Know that the Spirit of the Lord is wherever you are. Coming from this table, God loves you, and you are still part of the body. You are still part of the body. No matter what we're doing here, you are not forgotten. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world to proclaim your word, to shine your light, Yes, to love like you do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand now for our closing hymn, number 571, Go Make of All Disciples. 571. Friends, you have been called into this place to worship God, to give Him glory. Let that praise that you have offered in this sanctuary continue as you go from it. Go. Go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In peace, brothers and sisters, go. Amen.